Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, the 14th of December. Our topic today is the featured teacher, Wes Fryer. I am Lori Moffat, one of the three co-hosts of the show, along with Peggy George and Tammy Moore, who's going to be doing closed captioning today. So thank you, Tammy, for doing that. Wes's uh, website is here on this slide. And here is the page that shows the live binder for the show today. Um, the different thing about the Classroom 2.0 live binders in recent months is that the individual pages are in a column on the left rather than across the top. And Peggy has, um, or will put, post the live binders link in the chat. All of the resources for this show are going to be in the live binder, including any links that participants put in the chat today. Uh, the recordings at the end of the show will be posted at the archives and resources page at classroom2.0.com, live.classroom2.0.com. And um, you can get the archives in various formats that I'll talk about later. I would ask you to now pick that pointer tool and show us in the world where you're logging in from. I'm logging in from Central Pennsylvania. Uh, Peggy's logging in from Phoenix, Arizona. Tammy's logging in from Southwest Arkansas. Uh, I, sorry, Wes, I forget where you're logging in from. Um, but right now, it is cold and snowing in Pennsylvania. Oklahoma City is where Wes is logging in from. Usually, we've got an international crowd, and today we do. OK, for the first polling question, again, you answer these with the icon next to your name. Uh, it's these choices don't work. It looks like this in the participants list. Uh, Polling question one, have you or your students used the Hopscotch iPad app? It's a yes or no question. And I will publish these to the whiteboard. Now, out of the people that voted, only two have, 14 have not. Now, there's some people that didn't vote, but that could be because they didn't find the tool. Um, so most have not used the Hopscotch iPad app. The next polling question, have you or your students created a program using Scratch? I'll let me clear that list first, and then you can vote again. So I'll give you a chance to vote. And then I will publish them. And out of the group, 31% of us have used Scratch. Our students have used Scratch to program, while 41% have not. Our next question, have you used Minecraft in your classroom with students? And I'll publish these answers to the whiteboard. 62% have not, 9% have used Minecraft in the classroom. Again, I'd like to introduce our featured teacher today, Wes Fryer. And Wes is a grade four to five STEM teacher currently in Independence Elementary School in Yukon, Oklahoma. 
Dr. Wesley Fryer is an outstanding teacher, visionary educator, and sought-after digital learning consultant. Wes shares dynamic, inspiring, engaging, and practical keynotes, workshops, and other presentations, including video conferences for educators, librarians, school administrators, and community leaders around the United States and in other countries. He's the author of two e-books, Mapping Media to the Common Core, Volume 1, and Playing with Media, Simple Ideas for Powerful Sharing. Wes's advocacy efforts and presentations focus on digital literacy, digital storytelling, authentic differentiated assessment strategies, educational leadership, implementation of common core state standards, especially as they apply to writing across the curriculum and to one and to one learning. And I will ask the newbie question and then turn the mic over to Wes. I will be capturing questions as they go by. The question is for Wes, what does Web 2.0 mean to you and why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? OK, and this is for me to answer, right, as a newbie question? That's correct, Wes. <laughs> okay. uh, I think Web 2.0 means the interactive web. So it means the ability to not only access and consume information, but also interactively share it and publish it. So it's really the opportunity to become a publisher and to become an interactor with digital content of various types. That can just be text, but it can also be multimedia. All right. Well, thank you all so much for being here on this Saturday, whether I, I guess it looked like we were all from the Western Hemisphere, so it's uh, Saturday morning or early afternoon. But uh, today I'm very thankful for the chance to talk a little bit about some activities and lessons with students that I've been working on, uh, some of these for a few years and then some you know, just in the last couple weeks. So Peggy has done a wonderful job collecting resources in the live binder, and she'll be sharing that link. And this is also available as a uh, slide share so that you can access um, all of these slides and all of this content. Um, by a show of hands, um, how we, we, we uh, talked about this in the chat before we started, but how many of you have participated in the Hour of Code with some students this week? You can just uh, raise your hand just to kind of show how many have done that. Um, if you're not familiar with it, the Hour of Code, I think this is the first year for it, is an effort to really try and elevate the visibility of STEM education and specifically coding for students and provide a host of different opportunities and resources for students to be able to be exposed to code. Even if you don't have a computer lab or tablets or computers of any kind that you can present you know, for students and use, use with students, I guess, in class, there are even offline activities that you can do. And um, it's, it's, I think, a great initiative to try and, and elevate the importance of coding and the importance of um, computational thinking and some of the things that you know, people like Seymour Papert have been advocating for for a long time but have not been as visible in our classrooms as they need to be. And so hopefully the Hour of Code is going to be successful in not only providing time <coughs> this week and this month for these kinds of activities, but encouraging lots of teachers and students to jump in. And that would probably be my number one encouragement to you with any of the ideas that we talk about today is that you jump in and play with some of these and do this with students, because that has been one of my biggest lessons learned with all kinds of coding stuff, uh, but especially Scratch, is that the dynamics are so different when students are participating and when they are uh, involved. So today, um, the resources that I'm going to be talking about are all linked from my STEM website. So I created this site, stem.westfire.com, uh, when I became a STEM teacher this fall. And <clears throat> there's not a ton there, but basically as I am creating curriculum and finding curriculum and, and linking that, I, I am you know trying to share all of that, not only so that my students can access it, but hopefully so that other teachers interested in these projects can. <clears throat> and that's you know the number one way I have gotten all these ideas is from a, from wonderful teachers who are sharing resources and you know being very generous with uh, their digital sharing. So the three sections that are there we're going to talk about today are iPad coding, 
uh, Scratch and then Minecraft EDU. So I want to give just a short background before we jump into um, these different uh, programs and we'll talk about Minecraft first. But tell you that uh, Scratch is one of these things that I heard about years ago at the what was then called the NECC conference, now the ISTE conference. It's our International Technology Education Conference that's every summer. And I heard Dr. Mitch Resnick, who is at the MIT Media Lab, talk about Scratch. And I had friends, um, Bob Sprankle is one who had used Scratch with kids and, and others. And I, I just sensed this is, this is huge. This is so important. It's free software. Kids can do all kinds of things with it. They can tell stories. They can make games. They can create animations. You know, I remember in the mid-90s when I started teaching fourth grade, I had a student stay after school. And this is back in the days of Hyper Studio. And this student spent weeks and weeks making a simple frame-based animation with Hyper Studio. But his engagement and excitement was so huge, and kids still are very excited and can be very engaged with the opportunity to create this kind of interactive multimedia. So a couple years ago, I uh, partnered together with a, a nonprofit locally called the Div Junior, and we started offering some scratch camps. And as far as I know, we, we hadn't had any of these offered in Oklahoma yet, um, and we've only done about three of these so far. We've done these over spring break, and we've done some of the summer. We've done some that are Friday night, Saturday morning. Uh, last spring break, we did a five-day morning camp, and we're going to put together another one for this spring break. But um, all the resources for those camps are available uh, on, if you just Google Oklahoma Scratch Camp, you'll find the Google site. And there's nothing like jumping in with kids to using some of these tools to convince you it's the right thing to do because, golly, I, I struggle to find any other kind of activity that I have done or do now with students which, which creates the same level of enthusiasm and excitement that coding and creating you know, virtual interactives, um, I put Minecraft in that category too, that, that these things do. And so that kind of excitement and the learning that can result because of that uh, becomes impossible, I think, for adults who are around to ignore. And it just is a very powerful dynamic that I think all of us uh, should try to unleash constructively in our classrooms and in our communities. So I want to share the term chocolate broccoli. And it's, there's a website called Chocolate Broccoli, which I hadn't heard of before until I looked for a picture of it. But um, Zach Gilbert is an Illinois educator that has the handle Ed Gamer on Twitter. And um, he is the host of the Ed Gamer podcast, which is on the EdReach network. And I got to meet Zach in February. And then I, and through, I think, his podcast and, and talking with him, I think it was his podcast. I heard this this term. So in the chat, does anybody want to put in your definition of chocolate broccoli as it would pertain to uh, classroom learning and technology and gaming? Does anybody have a guess? You can just you know put it into the chat if if you have a guess. Um, basically, Zach says, ooh, and I guess I'm not scrolling down, so seeing the current things. Um, yeah, make, Mrs. Morgan says making something. Um, not fun, fun, trying a new taste, thinking out of the box. I think the way that, that Zach is using it is saying we've got to be careful that we're not trying to basically force feed the same stuff to kids like broccoli down their throats by simply putting a little chocolate on it. And sometimes when it comes to gaming in the classroom and it comes to um, you know, utilizing some of these tools, at times, we can look at our curriculum, and there's nothing wrong with looking at our curriculum and saying, gosh, how could you know, Minecraft be used as a simulation environment or, or Scratch? But sometimes, we're a little closed-minded to the possibilities, perhaps, and we, we're just thinking about that broccoli that we want them to eat. And I guess this analogy for me means that I'm not just thinking about the stuff I've been trying to get kids previously to learn and to do and to demonstrate with those skills, but it's more than that. And so I interpret the chocolate broccoli metaphor as kind of a warning to say, don't just think about what you've done in the past. I guess that's kind of, if you're familiar with the SAMR model, um, which is S-A-M-R, 
I'll put that in the chat. Somebody can get a link to it. It's not just accommodation level. We want to also look at transformative level technology integration that goes beyond what we've done before. So anyway, that's that's a metaphor, and I think that's a, a handy thing to you know not only think about, but maybe challenge other teachers that we work with to use as a metaphor as we think about technology integration and not just trying to you know put some chocolate um, on what we've traditionally done. What else can we do that we couldn't even do before? Um, because if we simply try to serve chocolate broccoli, we may, you know, we may not be taking full advantage of these tools and these possibilities. So, I want to encourage every person here to pick up this book, uh, Invent to Learn. This is Sylvia Martinez and Gary Stager's new book that they've published this year. Their website is called inventtolearn.com, and so many different things in this book are fantastic. But for me, one of the most challenging that comes early in, in the book um, was this idea that there are several categories of computer use, and this comes from uh, Robert Taylor in his 1980 book, uh, The Computer in School, and he talks about the tutor, the tool, and the 2T. Well, we are generally very familiar with the computer as tutor. We have CD -ROM, we've had CD-ROMs for years, now we have internet, we've got Khan Academy, we have all kinds of ways that the computer uh, through apps and, and websites and things is a tutor. We also are very familiar with the computer as a tool. I mean, Microsoft Office for years defined computer literacy for many schools and in many pre-service teacher education programs when it came to technology, you know, do you know Word, Excel, PowerPoint, all that stuff. But the 2T, and I have that in red and underlined is is a missing piece in so many different schools. And for the computer to be used as a 2T, we have to program it. We have to code it. We tell the computer what to do. And in the beginning of educational technology back in the early 80s, that's all we did because we didn't have CD-ROMs and the internet and all of these apps. But we kind of need to go back, um, you know, back in time. I don't know if that's back to the future, but we need to remember that it's not just about computer as publishing tool and productivity tool and computer as tutor. It's also about computer as 2T. That's the hour of code. Now, Sylvia and Gary go on to say, and, and by saying this, they quote Pappert, that's not necessarily it either because Pappert believes, and, and I love, well, I'll just read this in case somebody's listening and they can't read the slide. To Seymour Pappert, the strength of the computer lies in none of these categories. It is a material to be messed about with. The act of messing about, which we might call tinkering, is where the learning happens. The computer provides a flexible material that the child can weave into their own ideas and master for their own purposes. And I think that juxtaposes really nice with that idea of chocolate covered broccoli because that's how we may approach the technology and, and the, the learning is saying, here, I've got this broccoli, I want you guys to eat this, and so you know maybe I can put this chocolate on it and make it more palatable. Can we do that? Yeah, sure we can. But if we can find ways for students to be able to tinker and to mess about and to play with these powerful, powerful tools, not just in consuming information, you know, using the computer as a tutor, or even publishing, or even programming, but using it as a material, there's some very deep and rich learning that can take place. So that's a little bit of a, of a framework. I'm also going to reference uh, this, which is sometimes called the creative learning spiral. This is from Mitch Resnick's Tumblr account, which I think this is the only post on his, on his account. Um, and if you're going to have one post, this is an awesome one to have, because this spiral where we start out with imagination, and then we create, and then we play, and then we come back and share with others, and we reflect on what we've done, and that goes back to imagination, is a wonderful creative loop. And Scratch software specifically, but also Hopscotch that we'll talk about today, and even Minecraft can lend itself to this sort of a lesson cycle. So I really, I love that. I think that's very rich, and I would encourage um, all of us to take a look at that and see ways in which that lesson cycle can fit into our regular during the day lessons and then also maybe into some after school or some you know kind of computer camp, scratch camp activities, other things that we do with, with students. So why STEM, why coding? There are lots of reasons why people are excited about STEM and coding and the ones you see on the upper left of this slide, vocational opportunities and workforce needs, are probably some of the main 
things that you're going to hear politicians talk about. Here in Oklahoma, we had a, gov a STEM conference convened by the governor uh, on my birthday in, in uh, August this last year. Uh, it was just a coincidence it was on my birthday. Um, I didn't actually attend that, but you know, lots of talk about the workforce and the future, and this is true. I mean, there are lots of jobs now, and the projection is lots of jobs in the future that are going to require coding skills. But there are so many other reasons why STEM is important and coding is important. In the district where I teach, UConn, we're in the third year of having STEM as a special class that every fourth and fifth grader goes to, just like PE, music, and art. Um, now, I'm thankful this year that we've, we've changed it up a little bit so that instead of um, students just getting STEM once a week, I get to see students twice a week for 50 minutes, and then we, I switch off with the art teacher, so kids only have STEM for a semester. But gender equity is huge. Uh, women are very underrepresented in STEM fields, and we can't wait till kids are in even high school or college to be talking about this. We need to work on this when kids are in elementary school. Math anxiety is huge. There's a lot of fear that, that um, adults as well as kids have about math, and I'll talk about you know, scratch as well as hopscotch in the way that math is just integrated into the middle of it and it's the, it's the air you breathe, it's the water you swim in. You have to use math because that's how these programs work. Hands-on learning uh, is important and we can be encouraged with, with STEM lessons and with coding for kids to be hands-on. Um, Thinking computationally, that's different than artistic thinking when you're trying to make a sprite move across the screen or something happen with two objects collide, you know, those things are, um, it's computational. You get feedback in a different way than you do when you're creating some art. Creativity is vital. Problem solving is vital. Communication skills, all of these things can be developed. And they're at the bottom and the middle too. It's fun. Let's not forget that it's fun. So um, today we're going to talk about Minecraft EDU, Hopscotch, and Scratch. Both Hopscotch and Scratch are entirely free. Now, you definitely have to have devices to run this. Hopscotch is an iPad-based program. It's not available for Android, and I'm not aware of a similar program yet for Android that exists, although you can use browser-based things, and so that, that is something that you can explore. And the Hour of Code is a great site to explore for those kinds of resources. While well, Scratch will open up on an iPad, and there are some uh, iPad apps that will let you play Flash content, like Swifter, um, and um, oh, what's the other one? Um, somebody can put them into the chat. I don't have my iPad to look it up. Puffin. Puffin is another one. Um, it's not fully functional. So uh, that's why I, I needed with my iPad cart in my classroom to look at Hopscotch. Minecraft EDU is not free, but you can purchase the licenses at about half the cost that it takes um, to normally you know, buy Minecraft. And I'd actually like to start with Minecraft a little bit, and I'm going to say at the beginning, I do not, I am not trying to portray myself at all as an expert on Minecraft, either playing the game or on Minecraft EDU. Literally, I've just finished two weeks of Minecraft EDU with my students, and I'm going to share some of the things that we've learned. But just like I mentioned with Scratch, when I heard about it and saw the poss little glimpse, the possibilities, I knew it was something I needed to do with students. And so I feel like Minecraft fits into that same sort of category. So I've done a lot more <clears throat> with Scratch and, uh, and even with Hopscotch than Minecraft, but we're going to start there a little bit with Minecraft. So um, type into the chat if you would, if, you're, if you can. Uh, and you're not driving, of course. <laughs> what what do you think Minecraft is? How do you define Minecraft to others and explain it? Minecraft is something that you know. I think I I heard about first maybe two or three years ago from cousins of of ours that live in the Dallas area and always have shared different games with with my son Alexander. And uh, I had no idea, you know, really what it was. And Alexander started to play it and became a little aware of it. So uh, Verena said a tool to create. Peggy said a virtual world where you can create environments and games. Um, I would use the word sandbox to describe the the Minecraft environment. It it does have different games. It does have you know, these things called mobs, or which, which take different forms, but there's hostile mobs that spawn, and you can kill them, have to kill them to protect yourself if you're in survival mode. But it is a sandbox game that allows for a lot more 
it's not a first person shooter game. It's not a game that is simply filled with violence. There is a, a violent aspect to it. Um, there can be, but there doesn't have to be. And you know, the idea of a sandbox captures it well because it's a it's an open ended environment that can allow for so much building, so much creativity, and so much imagination. Uh, a lot like scratch, like scratch in some ways. So um, this is a screenshot of a Minecraft world that someone, I think this was the Ziggurat Pyramid perhaps, that, that, that someone had built. You will find all kinds of screenshots and videos on YouTube of people, that people have created with, um, uh, with Minecraft. There are different modes for Minecraft. So Minecraft has, as I understand it, basically three main modes. You have a single player, um, well, you can be single player or multiplayer. So uh, that's just in general. Where if you play by yourself, or if you want to open it up, you if you're on the same little network, um, you can open up your game and let someone else connect to you. And there are also servers that are online on the internet that people can connect to to play together. But you can play in what's called survival mode, uh, which is where the monsters come out, and you're, you usually have day, night, and day, and you have to be protecting yourself as well as collecting resources. And then there's a creative mode where you have all the building tools, all the resources, and you know you can build anything. You don't have to worry about hiding from monsters and things. So uh, sandbox is a good way to, to describe it. Um, last year, my son, who's now 16, uh, when he was a ninth grader and uh, 14 or 15, uh, did a little presentation for the K-12 online conference called Creating and Playing in Minecraft. And I'd encourage you to check that out. Um, we're in the process of cross-posting all of our videos to YouTube from past years uh, because our, uh, we've had some changes in, in where we've hosted those. And so that one is cross-posted and you can check that out. And you know, hearing this from a student perspective is a really good thing. And so basically Alexander just kind of shows what he does and how he enjoys, why he enjoys Minecraft and the kinds of things that are possible uh, with the program. I'd also uh, point you to a presentation called Create Your Own Maker Culture in the Library. And this was something I did with School Library Journal and with several other educators. And this also opened my eyes to Minecraft because librarians were talking about how they were having, they were, they were providing maker spaces in the library. They were providing uh, evenings or Saturdays for kids to come in and share what they've done with Minecraft and just the energy and excitement that is around that. Um, I want to give a really great shout out to uh, Zach Gilbert and Ed Gamer. I encourage you to follow Zach on Twitter and check out the Ed Gamer podcast on EdReach. It's a weekly podcast that is now done via Google Hangout. Um, I met him at the ICE conference last year, and you know Zach encouraged me to play games with my son. It was after this conference that I said to Alexander, "Hey, I think I need to buy Minecraft. Will you teach me?" And so we did that a little, and now we've been doing it more since I'm using it in my classroom. And we are so busy; there are so many different tools to use, but nothing beats playing some of these games and using some of these tools with kids to get our heads wrapped around you know, what we can do with it and then how we use them in the classroom. Zach also told me about this wonderful conference called the SIT Conference. It's the Students Involved with Technology Conference in Illinois. And I would love it if in Oklahoma we could have at some point a similar kind of event which is for students, uh, all about students, sharing what they know and what they can do with technology. And Minecraft played a huge role in the SIT conference last year, and I bet it will this year again. So the um, probably most impressive Minecraft project that I've ever seen is this one that was created by a fourth grader last year about a San Diego mission project. And um, I will give a shout out to Holly EdTechDiva, uh, who I think uh, shared this in a Classroom 2.0 uh, webinar a, a few months ago. And there's a link that can give you some more information about the backstory. But basically, in creative mode, a fourth grader built this entire mission uh, in San Diego and then takes us on a four minute, 12 second tour of this mission. And it is phenomenal. It's one of these amazing projects that will kind of blow your mind. And so this is a great one to share with teachers and also share with students. Because even if students have played in Minecraft, they are not necessarily seeing it as a tool to use in school. 
to demonstrate things and to show what they know and you know to 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 be a project. And so if you compare this video project to a traditional diorama that wouldn't have you know, student voice recorded like a QR code or something. Just there it is, the diorama. There are there's so much more depth to this project in terms of being able to see and hear what the student learned and what they explored and, and having them prove what they what they know. It's it's fantastic. It's one of my favorite projects to share. So Minecraft EDU is an educational port of the Minecraft program. If you or your students or your kids or grandkids just want to go out and buy Minecraft, it costs about 26 US dollars to buy a license. But uh, Joel Levin and other educators have worked with the Minecraft creators to offer this at about a 50% discount. So they have a package that is like 25 licenses. And I needed 29 licenses because you need one license for each seat that you're going to you know, have a student playing Minecraft and using it at your school. And my biggest class is 29 students. So that costs about $430. Uh, you can get a custom quote uh, from them, but it is not free. You do have to buy it. However, it is wonderful not only because of the discount, but also because of the tools that it affords you um, with Minecraft in terms of being able to turn things on or off. You can give resources. You just have a lot more control. Now, students, when you install Minecraft, can play in that single player mode. And this second week, as we've been playing, we were actually, I had about two thirds of my students doing that <clears throat> because when you run a server and you have, you know, 29 students all connected to it at the same time, it can slow down and, you know, lag is what the students will say. It'll be laggy. Um, and so there are some different issues to, to take into consideration here. Um, but Minecraft EDU, I think if you're going to use Minecraft in the classroom, is definitely the way to go. Um, I have been using my uh, classroom Dell computer, which has four gigs of RAM. I got another extra gig from our IT department as my server. Um, but what I uh, just did today was order um, 16 gigs of RAM for a little Mac Mini that I'm going to, to be using next semester. And um, you, you're going to have to think about you know, different sorts of, of issues if you're going to have all the students together on the same server or if you're going to have them on separate, separate servers. Um, there is a great wiki that you can access for Minecraft EDU, and they're starting to post different lessons there and some videos and screencasts. Um, you also uh, will have links to, and I've got these on my uh, STEM site, links to a great Google group. And I've had some su super suggestions and help from other teachers using Minecraft, you know, posting things there. And so you, you definitely want to um, check out those resources. Um, I started off with what's called just the tutorial world that comes with Minecraft EDU. And all my kids connected to it, and it had a lot of features turned off, you know, so students can't, for instance, use TNT to blow things up, and weather effects were turned off, night was turned off, um, things that require more server, you know, uh, resources, um, but also, you know, could be disruptive. And so the tutorial world is a great initial lesson. Uh, students follow kind of, it's not the yellow brick road, it's the blue um, stone road, or some of, one of my students said it's the, what was the word for it? Uh, something lapis, there's a, a lap, lapis, I don't know, it's a blue, it's a word that means blue stone. But anyway, um, that's kind of what we started out with. And then I wanted to create some challenges because I have some kids who are pretty expert on Minecraft and then, you know, some that had never played before. And so I came up with a set of three different challenges. The advanced challenge was to bake a cake with a group. Now, that's a pretty challenging thing to do in 35 or 40 minutes, um, which is about how long we had. The basic challenge was simply making tools, crafting tools with what's called your crafting window and a crafting table. So yes, that's it, Janet. Lapis lazuli. Thank you. Um, so I'm excited to um, you know, continue exploring this. We're really just scratching the surface. Uh, other teachers are, are utilizing this. And I think, with hindsight, the second challenge that I created for students, I probably would, next time, I'll make it a creative challenge and a building challenge. Because there's things kids can create individually, and there's things that kids can, you know, create together on teams. And, you know, what you end up enabling in your, in your lab 
uh, is going to vary on you know the, the computer that you have available if you have one for a server uh, and other kinds of things. But one of my big lessons learned, and I had heard this from Zach Gilbert and others talking about Minecraft, is that even though kids have created with Minecraft, it doesn't mean they necessarily have a strong foundation in, in the game, even in crafting. And a lot of kids may have played Minecraft on a tablet or on a console like an Xbox, but they, they won't necessarily know how to play on the computer. And so uh, having some basic you know, kinds of challenges like this um, was really helpful. And I'll, I will say this, it was huge to be able to create a screencast of what I wanted to show students and then speed that up and do a voiceover. And so I did that this, this last week. I've got that on my site as well. It took me about 45 minutes to do this, this basic challenge with you know, building wood tools and stone tools. My son did it in four minutes, you know, but he's 16 and he's been playing Minecraft for three years or something, or I don't know, two years. He's been playing a long time. And so um, <laughs> I think that built credibility with my class when they saw, you know, how quickly he was building these things. But it also allowed me to create um, a video that I could not only play in class for students for the 11 classes that I, that I have, but make that available on my site so that students can go back. And I had students asking, can I keep this challenge sheet? Can I keep this recipe? These things are all available on the Minecraft wiki. But anyway, that worked out really well, and I'm going to continue to, to use screencast video in that way. Um, Carolyn's asking, what's the link for the cake recipe? If you just Google Minecraft Wiki and then search cake for that, you will find recipes for all of those things right on the Minecraft uh, Wiki. And um, I've got um, some links to those on the uh, STEM website. And I also found a great little video that another Minecrafter had made where they show that process of creating the cake. So um, Minecraft lends itself to all kinds of challenges, crafting, things, building things, exploring, and solving problems. Now, I'm teaching fourth and fifth graders, and one of the things that becomes really evident when you jump into a project with Minecraft is the computer literacy skill differences between students. I've got students who have, were not until the last couple of weeks familiar with right clicking. You, you would think, oh yeah, kids know all know how to right click. No, they don't. And so even when we're just in the crafting window, you know, making wood into planks and into sticks and then making these tools, we're learning left click, right click, here's the escape key. Uh, those are basic things. But let me tell you, the motivation in the lab has, I, I've, I have never seen it higher than I saw it this week with Minecraft and last week. Um, you know, getting a class of students to just log in <laughs> with their own user ID and password in the lab is a, is a real challenge. And most of the teachers in our building um, do not have students log in on, on, in the lab. So um, it, it, it's been a good thing in, on, on lots of fronts, not just for learning Minecraft skills, but you know, having lots of incentive for students to, to be logging in and being able to get into this quickly, learning you know, keyboard skills. And I'll say this too, learning some digital citizenship skills with text chatting. Because one of the things when you're on a server world together that students can do is press the T key and then they can chat with each other. And I required all my students to use their real first name, not to use an alias, because I needed to know who was who. But just about every class, you know, something came up where, you know, we didn't have any profanity and we talked about this in advance. You know, what are some rules for text chatting? But we had someone, you know, say something inappropriate to somebody else. And anyway, it provides this good sandbox opportunity to, to talk about those things and, and do those things together. So let's shift gears a little bit now and talk about Hopscotch. Um, Hopscotch is a free app for iPad that is the most scratch-like app that's available on the iPad today. And there are some apps available for younger students if you teach, you know, first grade, second grade, uh, kids that are younger. Um, I tried to find curriculum for Hopscotch, couldn't find some, and so I just went ahead and created a short ebook called Hopscotch Challenges, and I published this uh, for free. It's right now just on Dropbox, and it's on uh, Smashwords. I have it on Amazon, but it's, you can't put it at zero in Amazon 
until you get reported as it's free somewhere else. And so um, I hope over the holidays to get it put also on the iBook store for Apple. But you can just download that right to your iPad. You can also uh, view it on other devices using a, another ebook reader. Um, I created this using an iPad app called Creative Book Builder, which is a $3 app. And I'm not going to go through all of the chapters, but what I wanted to do was not having you know 40 minutes of lecture with my students and teach them hopscotch I wanted to show them something engaging and exciting and then give them challenges that they could do so the challenge for the first week was to tilt control the iPad and make a simple collision game and then the second week we uh, focused on geometric shapes and pictures so if you're familiar with scratch the origin in the scratch screen is zero zero but in hopscotch it's really quadrant one of the 2d coordinate grid so zero zero is in the bottom left corner and the the uh, y coordinates there go up I think to maybe 900 and X uh, goes to 700 when you pull down the uh, screen on hopscotch you can show the coordinate grid decide where you want your icon to start and then you see the X and Y coordinate and I love how Y is in pink and blue is in uh, or X is in blue, and we're immediately, you know, talking about the coordinate grid system when we're, we're moving stuff around. You drag the blocks in hopscotch out from the left side uh, to the right, just like you do with scratch. So this is a block-based coding environment. And you have what I call triggers. I don't know what hopscotch officially calls these. But you have a trigger like when the iPad is tilted up, you know, what do you want to have happen? So you can say change Y by positive 100. And so this is where we see, just like with Scratch, math being the language that you breathe in hopscotch because we're talking about, you know, going up or down or go up or to the right, that's positive, or to the left or down, and that's negative. And so um, one of the neatest things about hopscotch you can't do with scratch is you have an accelerometer inside. So tilt control is very cool. And how do I get my my, my sprite or character in hopscotch to respond and so you have triggers when the iPad's tilted down left and right you know what do you want to have happen just this activity right here is a great one for students because it's iterative it allows them to tinker and to play and pardon me and problem solve and figure out you know how do I get my iPad to do what I want this is computational thinking and it's a very simple challenge but it leads to some really good exploration and discovery with students um, the other thing that you can do in addition to having a sprite respond to your tilting commands or your tilting actions you just have something happen when objects collide and so the trigger then for a second character you just click the white plus there at the top to add another character you can have the trigger be you know when the gorilla collides with the octopus or whatever you name your characters you can give them different names they can disappear uh, you can make a loop so that they're going to do something like this um, this was a little simple loop so under control the blue blocks we drag out repeat and so when the gorilla collides with the octopus um, it just started to get bigger and bigger and it rotated the glee the giddy excitement that my fourth and fifth graders had you know seeing this happen and then doing it themselves is just priceless and this is coding this is kids having agency over a digital device and not just playing an app or a game someone else has created but they are are making it be the 2T. They are telling it what to do and they're exploring. And so there are all kinds of possibilities. So we show something to students and then encourage them to be creative and do something different, you know, that they hadn't seen before. So the second week I encourage students to create pictures and to draw shapes. Uh, simply starting with a circle. I don't know if I've got this one large, but uh, yeah. This is a sample project that comes with Hopscotch. You can uh, open it up when you click Browse. It's called the Solar System. And there are different letters for Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter. And so um, someone with more advanced skill, math skills than I uh, has figured out how to approximate the orbits of the different planets in our solar system. But you can then look at the code 
and do it yourself. Just like with, you know, HTML code, you can, you know, look at that. That gets kind of complicated. But with Scratch, you know, you get to look at the code. How did they do that? Can I copy that? Can I see that? You can do the same thing. So um, what you're looking at right now on the screen is sort of the core of a, of a repeating shape. You've got a blue repeat block. You have what would in Scratch be called pin down, but here it's called leave a trail in Hopscotch. And then you have some rotation and some movement. And this is going to create a circle. Uh, and so students can, uh, can do that. Inside the um, Hopscotch Challenges book, um, I've got a section or a chapter on drawing polygons. So here's how you can draw triangles and squares and um, pentagons and hexagons and octagons. And so you do that by changing the interior angle. And so that was something else that students explored. Um, here I think you see the, some code that would start a hexagon. And you can set the position or they can you know, choose to move the sprite at the top into a starting position. One of the things we found was really fun. I don't know if you remember Spirograph. It was this game, I think, in the 80s where you had these plastic circles usually, and you put them inside other plastic circles that had little teeth, and you'd put your pin inside, you'd spin them around, and they made um, different kinds of shapes. And so um, a repeating polygon like that can be created in hopscotch pretty easily when you don't use the exact interior angle for a polygon. For instance, instead of 30 degrees for um, your angle, you can make it 33 degrees or 93 degrees. And when you have an odd number, you know, instead of an even, then it can repeat uh, more. So there's all kinds of shapes that you can create. I think um, this is an example of a student project. And I think I, did I include the picture? I included some pictures and, and, and um, I think I've got one here coming up, but draw a picture was the next challenge, yes. And here is one, this, I actually uh, created this one, but I used some student code. Um, I have a sun that's up there, and then I have this volcano, but then one of my students discovered how to create this code at the bottom, which I kind of think looks like, you know, trees on the mountain, uh, or, or in other versions, it looks like a tower on a wall. Um, but, but that is uh, a project, and um, what you, the only thing they did differently here uh, is that first orange block where it said change x by distance. So this is, again, tinkering. This is playing. This is kids have an opportunity to see an idea and play with it. And I had students you know, at the end of class coming up and sharing what they, what they had made. And <laughs> it's so exciting to have a class where kids are having so much fun. They don't want to leave. Everybody wants to come up you know, and, and plug their iPad in so they can show what they've done. Um, and I'm, and I'm probably exaggerating a little bit. Not everyone, right? Not everyone's going to be engaged by this, but a lot of students are really loving this, and they're excited, and this is a free app. So yes, you have to have an iPad, but if anybody in their family over the holidays you know, has an iPad, they can put on Hopscotch, and they can show them how to do this. So ideas for creating a Hopscotch game. Um, I had some students do this, but we didn't get into you know, the more advanced side. And you totally can. There, there's a random block that you can pull out, so you can have um, a, a character spawn in a random location on the screen, and then they can move, you know, random distances, and uh, that really allows for some, um, you know, some different possibilities. You can also have a variable that you put in there. And in the newest version of Hopscotch, which they, up, which they updated in about the last month, um, you can share your project. So. In the upper left corner there, you tap on what looks like a bulleted list icon, and it has a drop down. And after you have a scratch, or sorry, a hopscotch project open for maybe, I don't know, 30 seconds or a minute, it automatically creates a hyperlink where it is shared online. So there's not a community of hopscotch projects like you have for Scratch, but you do now have these links that are automatically created. And if you tap share, you get an email link. But you can also just tap and open it in your browser. And then you can you know, put that on a web page or um, make a little shortcut on your iPad that goes to it. There's different ways that you can have that uh, link shared. And so that's exciting, because when we started with Hopscotch, that feature wasn't available, and they uh, updated the app <coughs> with that additional feature. So um, you can rename your projects, put your name on it, and give your, your uh, project a title. And this is what it looks like on the web version. Uh, when you view your project, it'll have the, I think, first character that you have of your project, and it'll have the title and your name um, saved there to others. So um, Hopscotch 
is great. It is a wonderful app. I really think Scratch, though, has more possibilities. <clears throat> and for my classroom setting where we have a cart of iPads that we can use every day, but a computer lab that's very limited, um, I didn't have the chance to, to really you know, use Scratch with them. Um, but I'm going to be restarting a Scratch club that uh, the teacher before me, I helped him uh, start last year, because uh, Scratch is where, where the real depth is. And um, Scratch, if you're not familiar with it, is provided by MIT. It is, I think, been around five years, uh, just had its five-year birthday. And there are now over four million Scratch projects shared. And it's incredible to see this grow because about a year ago, spring break, I want to say there were three million. <laughs> now there's four million. And so Scratch allows the creation of stories, games, animations, and all of it is by you know, using these blocks. And Hopscotch has a far more limited number of blocks that are available than Scratch does. Scratch has several hundred, and I, I don't know, Hopscotch probably has less than 100. I, don't, I should know that number. Um, but this is the quotation from Dr. Mitch Resnick that really stuck with me when I heard him talk about uh, Scratch, he says it has a low bar and a high ceiling. And that limbo picture there isn't necessarily the best visualization of a low bar. It's, what would be better is if we had someone kind of stepping over a low fence. Because low bar means, yes, your first graders can do it. Yes, you know, young kids can do it. Yes, teachers of all stripes and, and grade levels can do this. But high ceiling means there are so many possibilities. You can do very complex, complicated things um, with especially Scratch. And, and so whether you're talking about students that are in high school or students that are in college, I mean, there's all kinds of more advanced programming environments to get into. But I wouldn't ever look at Scratch and say, oh, that's not that's so elementary. You can't do that with middle school. Or you, know, you can't do that with high school. Absolutely, you can. And so um, I would refer you to the Scratch Camp Wiki that I've been working on for a couple of years. We'll continue to update this site site for resources for the spring break Scratch Camp. And then we're going to be offering somewhere somewhere there. I'm not sure. I think we've my wife my wife has two students downtown downtown the university go to the city university university community computer lab. And I hope that maybe we'll be host it. But we've been collaborating. Well, excuse me. Uh, your audio yes, is yes. buzzing out on us. Could you try turning your microphone Thank off and turning it back on again and see if that solves the problem? You bet. Is that better, Peggy? Oh, Thank yes. You. Thank you. You know, I'm using that old headset, and we've had this problem before, where uh, after about 45 minutes, it just, for whatever reason. So, yeah, sorry about that. Thank you for the fix. So I don't know if you if you heard the uh, that list last bit, but basically the tutorials and things like that that uh, we've used in Scratch Camp are linked here. My favorite part of Scratch Camp is always when students reflect on their projects. This is the metacognition where they think about their thinking, they explain their project. How did you do this? And so in the the Scratch Camp. Uh, pages for March 2013, you'll see short videos. I just shot these on my iPhone, and then the kids talked about their projects. And so, um, you know, this is part of that, that lesson cycle that I talked about at the beginning that Mitch Resnick has on his Tumblr site, where we reflect. And it's so important to reflect and have students, you know, thinking about their thinking, explaining their thinking, and sharing that with other students as well. Um, one of the lessons learned having done a few of these scratch camps is that it's great to have different challenges and even printable pages of, of blocks that students can, and adults can use as well. Um, there's an eight block scratch challenge that we've used several times to introduce scratch where you just have a limited number. <clears throat> because like other things, it can be intimidating to have, you know, hundreds of blocks. So where do we start? We'll start with eight blocks and, you know, learn how to do some real basic sort of uh, cartoon-like dialogue, or, or you know, there's different things that you can do. Um, there are lots of good links to what are now called studios. It's like a playlist of projects that the Scratch education team has put together. So this is something good to help raise awareness of art projects and story projects and maze projects and game projects. <clears throat> but then also, there are some really good um, single-page PDFs that students can use to make different kinds of projects. Now, I've really liked using maze games uh, because you can 
pretty simply create a maze with an object and define a color and say when they collide, you know, you bounce back or something like that. Um, but there are other ones that I've got links to those that are collide games or guessing games, kind of like a Mad Lib project. And um, those are, are great resources, and most of those have been created by the Scratch team and published in their curriculum. So just a couple more resources, and then uh, maybe we'll have a minute or two for questions. Um, I've got a project I've worked on a couple years now called Mapping Media to the Common Core, which are 12 different media products that students can create. One of those is simulation or game. So if you simply Google Mapping Media, you'll find this. Click on the Scratch Cat. And you'll find links to not only Scratch, but other kinds of software options for coding. Uh, there's a link to the project on the San Diego Minecraft <laughs> uh, mission project and, and other things. And I'm going to continue to update that. Um, the last little story I want to end with is this one. Uh, Scratch Camp uh, in July of 2012 had a student who was a third grader. He'd actually gone to kindergarten with my youngest daughter. And on the last day, we're doing show and tell, and he's showing this project, which is called Don't Be Seen. And when you get to level eight, there's 10 levels to it. It's not a super complex game, but it gets more and more challenging. We suddenly have this teleportation portal. And you have to, the witch, you have to use your arrow keys and go up to the, the portal, and then you teleport off to the other side, because you can't cross the, the dotted black line there if, if, you, if you don't. And it was so awesome because he had collaborated with his brother on these ideas, you know, to see him just far exceed anything that we had taught him how to do in Scratch Camp, and he had used his creativity, his knowledge of other kinds of games, but he had created his own game. And I just, it was like this priceless moment. Yes, this is so exciting. And, the, you know, having students do that is, is great. And they will. They will do that, given the opportunity and, and given the tools. Students with Scratch, with uh, Minecraft, with Hopscotch will exceed our expectations. So I didn't leave too much time for questions. But let me open it up and see what you all would like to ask, and I'll do my best to answer. Thanks so much, Wes. Let me go back to my question list and see what I have here. Um, is um, the Invent to Learn book still free to download, the ebook? No, it's not. And I think what they did, and I've learned this about publishing, when you, there's a, a deal where with Amazon, if you list your book exclusively with them for a certain, like a, a few times a year, basically, you can make it free for up to one or two weeks or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it, there was a window of time when it was a free download. Uh, they could make it free again. Um, I did download it when it was free. But it's, I don't think it currently is. And that's something that Amazon limits with their Kindle Direct Publishing. You, you can't just say, hey, I want to give this away uh, and make it free. If you choose to be exclusive with them, they give you this option to make it free for limited amounts of time. But you can't, you know, you're limited in how long you can make it free if you publish exclusively with them. OK. Someone asked, do you have a, a tech class that's more focused than, than STEM? Uh, it, with students, no. With um, students, we, yeah, no. It's the STEM STEM class is we don't we don't have a computer class in our in our building. So uh -huh. any of the you know com, you know we have library, and so there can be some things that our librarian you know will do with students. But no, we don't, and we don't yet have really the vertical tie with STEM in our district all the way up through high school. We're we're working on that. We do have a computer technology teacher at our sixth grade uh, campus. Who is doing you know STEM activities, but that's really not yet a continued thread of, of courses through you know seventh and eighth grade in high school. A lot of this teacher students have Minecraft at home. What do you think about having them bring their personal accounts into the classroom? You know, I think that having them build things that they've made and show those and giving that as an option for students. For instance, if you had a project like that, you know, a missions project, and instead of making a physical diorama, they could create a virtual diorama in creative mode would, would be great. Um, you know, I've had students who definitely wanted to be playing on their own account. And you can log, have, let students log in with their Minecraft accounts when you install Minecraft EDU. Um, I think having them bring stuff that they've made is, is great. Ultimately, though, I think 
it would be good to purchase at least some EDU licenses. And when we talk about the digital divide, not everyone's got a computer at home. Not everybody's parent. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've got kids. You, you know, have told me my, my mom won't let me play Minecraft. And um, and there's all kinds of ideas about you know what we should be having kids do after school, and we have too much screen time and all that stuff. So um, ideally, I think it would be great to provide opportunities, be that in the lab or the, or the library or the classroom, where students might be able to you know, use it if they don't have a chance at home. One of the things I am going to do with my licenses um, is you can activate them and then check them out to students. And so our librarian is going to barcode uh, CDs that I'm burning with the, the license code so that you know, students who want to can check it out and use it for a limited at a time, they'll check it, have to check it back in. But um, I would just start with if, if they've built something and, and done something, for instance, in creative mode, bring it into class and be able to share it. And you could use that example of the San Diego Missions Project, and it'd be great to, you know, help your students create screencasts of their own Minecraft projects, or encourage them to do that with parents or, or with, with others. It'd be a great thing to do. Mm -hmm. Someone was very confused about what playing Minecraft meant. Is that like a, a video game or is that building something like that fourth grader demo of the mission? Right. So yeah, playing Minecraft can mean all kinds of things. It is a sandbox game. So playing Minecraft can mean going by yourself into creative mode and building something like that fourth grader built the mission uh, simulation. It can mean connecting to servers online and actually playing interactive games with other players. Mm -hmm. uh, my son has a friend come over with his laptop, and they'll go online and play these different games together. They connect to the same server, and then they're playing different games competing live against other Minecraft players. Um, it can also mean being in survival mode, where you have day and night, and where the monsters come out at night, and you have to uh, dig and find resources and build tools and, and weapons to protect yourself and, and those things. So playing Minecraft is a big umbrella, and it, or it's a large umbrella that can encompass many different things. So typically students are going to be you know, playing Minecraft probably in survival mode. They're not necessarily going to be collaboratively building. Um, but maybe they are. I mean, it, just, it kind of just depends on how they've used it. And so it's probably good to highlight those possibilities not only for teachers, but also for students as well, who may just have a limited experience with Minecraft and not seeing these other kinds of possibilities. Mm -hmm. It looks like Sam will be taking the mic once he's finished audio setup. Uh, I will ask a couple more questions that I have here. Any thoughts on how I can gain more access to resources only open to teachers to somebody who isn't a teacher currently? So in, with respect to Minecraft or? Maybe other Web 2.0 resources as well. More than just Minecraft, I think the question referred to. Right. Hmm. Well, um, you know, being connected on Twitter and following different educators sharing resources mm -hmm. is, a, is a great way. Classroom 2.0 is a fantastic opportunity just about every Saturday, except holidays, you know, to get additional ideas. I think burn, build, building our personal learning networks and our personal learning uh, communities using, using social tools like Twitter and, um, and you know, Having a space to share, um, I, I think it's good to set up set up a website where it, it can be a home base for your students, and it can become a resource for others as well. Um, I think it's a journey, and there's all kinds of different steps to take along the way. Um, but uh, I'd also definitely have a shout out for the K-12 online conference. Um, we've been going, I think, now for eight years, and there are some great presentations and resources there for uh, K-12 online. I'll drop that link into the the text chat. So those are a couple mm -hmm. of ideas. Here was a question somebody asked, uh, do you think it would be better to have these STEM projects integrated into the classroom, or do you think it works best like you're doing to have it as a separate special like art and PE? We definitely want technology to be immersed 
to varying degrees in everything that we do. Just like we use pencils in all of our classes, we need to be using, you know, tablets, laptops, desktops, and, and handhelds, you know, when it's appropriate in all of our classrooms. But I, I, in situations where they've taken out computer or taken out a technology course, whether that's in a, a graduate or undergraduate program or that's at school, what I've seen happen is suddenly there's not there's not the emphasis on it, and so there, there mm -hmm. aren't the resources. I think, I think that we need coaching available for all teachers at all levels. We need opportunities to work and collaborate with others on lessons and not just be <laughs> siloed and, and independent. Um, but I think it's really important for us to have an emphasis. I mean, if we take, let's say we take away the art class and we just say to everybody, hey, everyone needs to be doing art. Well, what happens? Some people will do it, some people won't. And you'll have kids in the school that may not get art at all. So mm -hmm. because STEM is important, because art is important, because music and PE are important, I, I think personally that they really need to be separate courses that we do. I don't think we use that as an excuse to say, well, I don't have to do any art at all in my curriculum because the art teacher does all that. That happens sometimes when we have a technology uh, class. But we, we need to provide that opportunity for all students. So my vote is to have that available as a class but also, ideally, to have coaching available where the teachers can work with the library media specialist, the librarian, you know, can work with other teachers and, and have coaching opportunities to, to integrate um, not just technology, but integrate the arts and, you know, get better with our teaching. Thanks, Wes. Uh, Sam, you do have the mic now. You can click on the talk button. Okay. Hey, now, now we hear you. I'm like, I've done this before. <laughs> Wes, I was wondering if you've had much experience. Uh, some of the Minecraft EDU things I've read have talked about teachers setting up essentially math stations inside of a classroom world in Minecraft using like redstone as switches. But I, I don't understand that much at all. Is that something you know anything about? <laughs> My son, who's 16, just was telling me in the car yesterday, Dad, you really need to learn about redstone because you could teach some basics about circuits and, and logic <laughs> <laughs> using it. So I have definitely heard of it. He's done redstone. Redstone is like the wiring of Minecraft when you want to make switches that people push that you know open doors or, or do other kinds of things. Um, I, there are so many possibilities. It definitely could, could be a center activity that may, I want next semester to make my STEM class more of a center-based learning environment where we're not just all doing the same thing, but students are doing different projects in different places. And that really might be a way, since I, don't, since I have limited access to the computer lab, that I'm able to continue using Minecraft you know, more than just the two weeks I get to reserve the lab or something like that. So I've, uh, in the Google group, which had really, there's a, there's a Google community for Minecraft teachers, but the Google group is awesome. Um, one of the teachers was telling me about how they had been having their kids, you know, build polygons and build, you know, different kinds of three-dimensional shapes in Minecraft. And so there's a lot of, of possibilities there, especially in the collaborative environment. So again, I, as I said at the very beginning, I'm not trying to portray myself because I'm not as an expert on Minecraft EDU, uh, we've used it the last two weeks. We've learned a lot. I'm, I bet I've learned more than the kids. Um, and as I expected, just like with Scratch, the possibilities are here are so vast that it's, it's definitely a, a tent that we want to have in our classroom where we can be doing things. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a toolbox, but it's, it's an environment. And um, I will be hopefully learning about Redstone and, and some other things too. And having my kids teach about it too, right? Because I've got kids with expertise who know about that kind of stuff and it would be great for them to develop, a, you know, for instance, a world with, with some redstone challenges and, and come up with some of that rather than saying, hey, you know, Wes has to come up with all this. Uh, so I'll, I'll give that a shot. Mm -hmm. And by the way, thank you so much for your awesome uh, presentation on puppets uh, a couple weeks ago, Sam. That just totally inspired me and uh, really, really enjoyed that. Well, well, thank you. That's very kind of you. I had another one other question from Kayleen or Karen Lee about convincing administration. 
Uh, I think that's a that's a great question and, and one that could you know we could do a whole presentation on. I think that helping students constructively catch fire with excitement for coding is an important lever for getting the attention of administrators. And the first grade daughter of one of our elementary principals last spring break went to scratch camp and was so excited and you know she was talking about things that he knew involved negative and positive integers, the number line, lots of things that were in, the, in not only in the math curriculum but not yet in the first grade math curriculum. And you know because of her excitement he became aware that hey scratch is something I need to pay attention to. Can we how can we do this? How can we encourage this? So um, I think it, it may not be a sort of a, a frontal assault of saying, here, we need to do this in class. It could also be something like, hey, let's do a Friday night, Saturday morning uh, scratch camp and you know, try and raise awareness about what's, what's possible. Um, I, I don't know. That, that those, that's one way that, I, that I've seen administrators really take notice when, when they've had their own children get really excited and say, Dad, I've got to show you this. Look, you know, and they made the sprite go across the screen. But, you know, some folks may not think that's a big deal. But to that first grader, that was huge. And to the dad who's the principal watching this, he says, gosh, there, you know, what is this? And, and I think this is something we need to do more of because look at, look at what my daughter's learning and, and she's just getting started with it. Speaking of, I have another question from a participant. What scratch project would you prescribe for a third grader who's semi-savvy, I guess, in computers in Silicon Valley? Well, uh, on that scratch camp wiki, um, you can kind of see the, the um, series that we've done. I think maze games mm -hmm. are a great one if they haven't done that before. There's all kinds of variety and you can have levels, you know, with, with the maze game. And um, that is, that's been one of the sort of second or third things that we've introduced to students. Um, so I would look at maze games. Yes, I have used the uh, Scratch Ed All About Me activity. Right. Uh, probably a younger student would be able to do that without too much trouble without having to try and figure out levels. Right, uh, depending right. On their savvy. Oh, yeah, definitely. I have the student tell three things about themselves but using Scratch. Yes, definitely. Yeah, just, just having the speech bubbles and having interaction mm -hmm. between characters is a great, you know, maybe if not per second level right. project. Right. Well, those are the questions that I managed to capture. Um, I think we can go ahead and, and start wrapping up. Okay. Sounds good. Sorry I didn't leave quite as much time for questions. So our shows that are coming up for Classroom 2.0 Live next week, December 21st and, 20, and the week after the 28th of December, there are none because of our winter break. Uh, January 11th will be Carolyn Jacobs from the PBS Learning Media Resources Inspiring middle, middle School Literacy, a collection of online lessons for blended learning. January 18th, Adam Bello with EduClipper and EduTecker. And also no show January 25th because of the EduCon Philly, 24th to the 26th of January. Uh, Scratch 2.0 Live is proud to be nominated for an award in the Best Open PD Unconference Webinar Series. And I think, no, um, the voting closes the 18th of, de of December for this. So if you go to the EduBlog site, you can probably find the categories for this. And this is a slide about an upcoming webinar on Tuesday the 17th about um, personalized learning webinar series. Uh, the co-hosts are Barbara Bray and Kathleen McClaskey. Personalized learning to transform learning for all learners. And again, that's on Tuesday the 17th of December coming up next week. Steve Harganon right now is taking a break from the Future of Education interviews, but he'll be returning soon. 
And you can nominate a featured teacher. Today, Wes was our featured teacher. Last month, I was. Uh, fill out the form at this particular web address, tinyurl.com slash cr20live featured teacher nominate and leave out the E at the end of nominate. You can nominate yourself as well when you fill out that form. And as you exit the show today, you'll, your web browser should open with the Classroom 2.0 Live survey. Or in the chat box or the um, chat log, you can open the link for the survey there. Uh, the survey link also is in the Live Binder for each and every show. And then inside the Live Binder, select Classroom 2.0 Live survey. And um, you can click Complete the survey there and include topics you might like for upcoming shows. Also in the survey, you can request a professional development certificate. If you choose to do this, please include a, a personal email for the survey to be sent to. Uh, some school emails will block the certificate, so you might not get it if you use your school email address. The Archives for today's shows are available at, live, at iTunes U in both the video collection and audio collection. There's a link to get to them, tinyurl.com slash cr20live iTunes U. So you can listen to the recordings or watch the videos depending on which collection you are choosing to receive. And there are also uh, a link inside the Classroom 2.0 Live webpage that's an RSS feed of the show archives as well. So there are numerous ways to get the ar archives for the, the shows that we do each Saturday. So I'd like to offer special thanks to Wes Fryer, our guest for today, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and Web 2.0 Labs Project to Weebly.com for providing our website, and to everyone who participated in our show today. Thank you all for spending some time on a Saturday with us.